And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and teach all nations. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The closing lines of the book of Matthew. Jesus, or as everyone then called him, and we shall call him by his Hebrew name, Yeshua, Yeshua told his disciples to raise up other disciples and to teach them what Yeshua had taught his disciples. But today we hear stories about Jesus, but we seldom, if ever, hear the things that he taught his disciples. On the other hand, we hear plenty of interpretations on the English version of Paul's letters, some of which are so grossly mistranslated as to bear no resemblance to the Torah or the prophetic writings from which Paul constantly quotes. Yeshua's words are being stripped from their context, and individual sentences are quoted to support a particular denominational interpretation. But Yeshua said, I did not come to bring peace to the earth, but rather to bring a sword, a sword of division. That sword divided families, congregations in his days, and eventually nations. America is a product of that sort of division that separated us as a nation from the tyranny of those who claimed to rule by divine right, but denied us our God-given rights of liberty, freedom of will, freedom of choice. It was George Washington, a founding father and the first president of the United States of America that said, you cannot enslave a Bible reading people. The States of America, united as one nation under God, is the second nation on planet Earth to be founded upon God-given rights and God-given responsibilities. The blessings of liberty were the God-given rights that were secured by forming a limited constitutional republic. Along with these blessings come curses or God-given consequences for denying and shirking our responsibilities to the Creator. Both Israel and the United States of America, which were founded on God-given rights and responsibilities, were the two most prosperous and free nations in the history of human civilization. One nation started in slavery to Egypt. The latter started in servitude to the British crown. Yeshua not only declared that he came to bring a sword of division, but he also said in John chapter 10 and in verse 10, he said that the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. We're going to find out what that thief is a little bit later, but he said that I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This nation is a result of that abundance. Christian churches in America built the universities, the hospitals, the orphanages. They sent missionaries to the ends of the earth. Throughout history, both Christians and Jews have led every field of legitimate science and have invented almost every device that has benefited mankind. It is Christians and Jews who have feared God that have advanced human kindness and stopped the slaughter of millions upon millions under the hand of atheist governments around the world. As a nation, we have had the abundance to be a provision for the needy at home and abroad. When we, as individuals and as a nation, function as a conduit to provide blessings to others, our prosperity and ability to help others increases. One of the most profound principles that Yeshua articulated was that of being and living the lifestyle of a giver. One who gives out of what little they have sometimes, but to be a provision for those who have even less. This principle is often absconded by a crafty confidence artist parading around as ministers of the gospel who prey upon the weak and gullible. But Yeshua did not promise abundance if you give money to multi-million dollar private jet flying shysters. He, he did not preach a gospel of sowing and reaping so those who sow to the rich who promise a harvest of untold riches actually get all the riches that 
the people that they give to. The abundant life that Yeshua came to bring is dependent upon you. Living a life of giving, serving, and as he stated it clearly, do for others just the same as you would want them to do for you. He instructed his followers to be merciful in judgment, to be gracious when unjustly treated, to be loving even when you're hated, to be abused rather than to abuse. If you live a life of giving rather than getting, men, he said, will give back to you a good, full, abundant measure. We often hear this principle articulated in reverse, what goes around comes around. It's usually in response to someone who has done someone wrong. While that is true, the positive is even much more true. If you give abundantly, it will be given back to you even more abundantly. Yeshua said that your container will be filled up to the brim. It'll be shaken till settled. It'll be pressed down and compacted, and then even more will be added until it is running over. If you are a follower of Yeshua, and if you are not living this abundant life, something is wrong. If you are not overflowing, then something is wrong. And I don't mean financially. I'm not talking about wood, hand, stubble. I'm saying that he that dies with the most toys wins is not the principle that Yeshua is espousing. I'm saying that you might live in relative poverty. You might have a dirt floor. You might have one shirt and one pair of trousers and still have far more abundance than Baron Rothschild. In the eighth chapter of John, he records Yeshua's words. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now that I'm sure everyone wants, they want freedom, but what does this freedom entail? If we know the truth, we will be set free from the bondage of man-made religion. And when it comes to the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua lived and taught, and what he taught his disciples, he set them free from man-made religion from the bondage of religion. We are set free to live in obedience to the commandments of a loving Heavenly Father who has given us His instructions. In Hebrew, Torah, the words to rule and govern life. He has given us His, in, his instructions so that we might know how to love God and how to love our neighbor and do for our neighbor as we would want our neighbor or fellow man to do for us if he were in our shoes. Conversely, the rules of man-made religion builds a false prison around us. Religion demands that we conform to their self-defined world and submit to the manipulation of men who desire to control and extort from you that which does not belong to them. Religion wants your money, your time, your life, and they want it to build a temporary kingdom, a monument to their own self-importance. But did Yeshua ever build a building and ask people to come in, sit down, shut up, and give their 10% religion tax? No. He taught them the truth, and the truth set them free from the dominant religious system of his day. And what the dominant religious system of his day was then is no different than what it is now. He set people free from the bondage of man-made religion, which was, in his day, Phariseeism. Prushim in Hebrew, which means separated ones. Basically separated, a denomination, a cult. And we have the writings of the Pharisees that go back more than 300 years before the birth of Yeshua. When Yeshua entered the scene, the entire nation of Israel was under the domination of that particular religious sect that wanted to separate themselves and live a more holy, a more righteous life, but they did so by inventing their own rules and regulations in direct contradiction to the instructions in the Torah, which says no one is ever allowed to add one single commandment or diminish one single commandment from the instructions we received from Moses at Mount Sinai, because these instructions came directly from the Almighty. And these are the instructions that last forever. And as Yeshua said, do not think for one moment that I've come to destroy the Torah of the prophets. I have not come to destroy, I came to fulfill. He came to fill up and to show us how to live these things. 
because these are the rules to govern life. These are the instructions from the Almighty. And so you can join a cult. You can become a separated one. You can become a denomination. But, and in fact, right now, you are either a follower of Yeshua or you're basically in a cult. In an atheist dream world, there is no God. No God-given rights, only government-given rights. They can be altered or abolished at the whim of those who think they have no accountability to a higher power. As a whole, the population of the United States of America is now grossly ignorant of the Bible. You cannot enslave a Bible-reading people, but the Bible has been taken away from the understanding of the populace. We have become ignorant of the Bible, and we have ignored the warnings of our founding fathers. We have actually relinquished our responsibility to elect God-fearing judges and politicians to protect God-given rights. An atheist cannot protect God-given rights. It's against his nature. In fact, it's a blatant conflict of interest for an atheist to protect God-given rights. They, by nature, want to be the guardian class of Plato's Republic, privileged guardians of the states, demigods. And this is why we are plunging headlong into an atheist socialist slave state. We are being systematically enslaved because we no longer are a Bible-reading people. The Ivy League universities in America, which were founded to give the future leaders of this nation a thorough command of the Scriptures and to establish the moral compass of honesty and personal integrity, they have become the breeding grounds for the occult, a playground for those who have bowed the knee to Satan for their piece of the pie promised to those who sell their soul for a dollar. The fact of the matter is, the Bible is no longer read. It's not read, and when it is read, it's not understood. And the reason that the Bible is not understood, because we are no longer taught how to understand and to read the Bible. We are trained to think that King James English is just, oh, too difficult to understand. But, you know, that's, uh, that is my particular favorite version of the English Bible is the King James Version because we can go back with any number of resources and go right back to the original languages because no translation is going to be correct. In fact, the King James Version is not even a translation. I have a, um, I have right here, uh, thanks to Thomas Jefferson, I have his book stand here, and um, I, I have uh, the Interlinear Greek English New Testament. And this is something that everyone should have because here you have the Greek words and then you have the direct English translation under every single word. And so you can see this is a translation. And then it has to be reworked according to syntax so that we understand it in the target language, which in this case is English. There are so many resources that we have available to us by going back to the standard, which is a King James Version, and um, this is authorized by King James. Uh, uh, it was uh, done in 1611. As a matter of fact, there were two publications in 1611, and uh, the second version had corrected several things that were in the first version, and even the English language has changed from 1611 to what it is now. And that's why we're basically using the 1827 version of the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, my particular one was uh, published by Cambridge. They were the ones authorized to publish the King James Version in the first place. How we got the Bible is into the English language is really a fascinating story because it took the blood and lives of so many people to get a copy of this in our language so that we could read it. And then in just a little more than 100 years after this was translated into English, that is when the people on this continent stood up against divine right rule and said no. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal in that they are endowed by their creator with certain 
absolute inalienable rights, rights that cannot be stripped from the individual, not by religious system, not by a, a civil tyrant. These are God-given rights that we are basing this nation upon. And as long as the populace understood these God-given rights and God-given responsibilities, we would continue to live as a free people. But the prophet Jeremiah spoke, and so eloquently, even of this day. In Jeremiah chapter 2, and in verse 13, he said, and he is really, this is a word from the Almighty. He says, my people my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The Almighty is saying that, that He, He is the fountain of living water. It's limitless, a limitless supply, but instead of holding to his commandments and living according to his instructions, instead what we have done is we've stepped away and we've made up our own cistern. We've chiseled out our own stone water pot. But this stone water pot, this cistern, it's broken. It can hold no water. It's our own way of doing things. It's a we, we have fabricated a God of our own choosing and it can hold absolutely no water. When we forsake the Creator and make up our own image or our own likeness of God, our own celestial Santa Claus, our own name it and claim it God who is at our beck and call, our, our genie which we rub the Bible or we send an offering and outpour money and blessings to us, when we forsake the Creator, then we have made up our own God. See, our Creator reveals Himself in His Word, and He chose a people, a people who are in slavery in Egypt, brought them out by His mighty hand so that no one could ever doubt it, and brought them to a mountain where He shouted down His commandments after we agreed that we would obey His commandments, whatever they are, and he said, if you'll obey my commandments, I will make you a nation of priests. You will be my prophets to the entire world. It was at that point that we entered into a covenant with the Most High God, because he would make himself known to this nation, this nation of slaves. He would miraculously take them to a land that he promised their forefathers, and through his prophets, he would make himself known. And this was Israel's job. This is what Israel was chosen to be. They are the chosen people, and the Almighty said, you will be my peculiar treasure, says in the King James, but it is in Hebrew is segula, which is a treasure so precious that the king does not let it out of his hand. Nobody else touches it. And this is what he says of Israel. And now Israel is his instrument to make known his way and to reconcile the world back to him. This is what we are offered at Mount Sinai. We know the nature of the creator of the universe because he has revealed himself. And the revelation of himself is here in his word. We know his nature because he has revealed himself. We do not want to hew out our own cistern, our own stone pot, to hold a self-limited revelation of the creator of the universe. We don't want to make a, a blue elephant god. We, we, we want to know why we are here, what our responsibility is, and what this path in life, where it leads. It's my observation that most denominational theologians use the scriptures the way that a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. But we're not interested in propping up a power drunk religious system that manipulates, intimidates, and controls people for their own gain. And man-made religion is that. The Bible, in its original language, is the revealed word and will of the creator of the universe to his creation. It is the revelation of his nature it is his expectation for his creation. It is his will. It is his desire, the desire of a loving father for his children. Most people have never even read the Bible. They have no idea of that which it speaks. 
They've been given numbered sound bites called verses. They, they strip these, these sentences and sometimes just parts of sentences completely from their context and they use them to systematically build four walls around a flock of sheeple so that they can be fleeced at will by the higher denominational shepherd. We are going to go into the scripture. We're going to find out what Yeshua teaches because he is the one that came to set us free from religion. He is the one who promised us that he came to give us a life and to give it to us more abundantly than any religious system could imagine, more than any government wants us to have. And if we will tap into that, then we will understand what it was that Thomas Jefferson said. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, Thomas Jefferson wrote, the pursuit of happiness is everyone's individual path to find God's will for their life. Because when you find out why you're here and what God's will is for your life, that is when your life will become abundant. And this is when you will have the power in your life to live an abundant life. Yeshua said, all power has been given unto me. And so get out there and do what I'm telling you to do. Go out there and teach what I taught. Because if you teach what I taught, you will set people free from bondage. They will be free from religion. They will live an abundant life. Religious pundits expound the numbered sentences that prove the points that they want to make while they ignore the other scriptures which contradict their contrivances. But if the Bible is the revealed word and will of God, then we must consider it in its context from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 because it's all one book. It's one thing I do to all my Bibles to accurize it and I literally tear out the page that says, New Testament. Why do I do that? Because the last words of the prophet Malachi are being fulfilled on the next page. Take that out. There's no separation. It is one book. It is one stream. It is one revelation from beginning to end, and there is no division. When the Almighty speaks to the prophet Jeremiah, he says, my people have committed two evils. He's speaking about his people, the ones who at Mount Sinai promised, we promised that we would obey all the commandments that were to be shouted down from the flaming mountain, and we had no idea what those commandments would be when we said we will obey everything that the Almighty speaks. And in response to their promised obedience, the Almighty likewise promised that we would be a nation of priests, his prophets to the entire world. We would be protected as his untouchable treasure, protected as the pupil of his eye. And it is translated as apple of his eye. It's literally the pupil of his eye. Go ahead, try to touch the pupil of your eye. You can't do it. Every reflex is to guard the pupil of your eye. This is what he's saying about his people the ones that have forsaken him. Yet, the Almighty told the prophet Jeremiah that they had forsaken him. They had left behind the revelation of himself, the commandments that taught us how to love him and how to love our neighbor. And they're replaced with a manufactured religious system, and that system cannot hold water. I grew up in a broken cistern. I was in church five services every week, six if you count church softball practice and the resultant baseball or softball games that uh, everyone began with prayer. So, you know, this was my life. And by the time I was 17, I had memorized hundreds of verses, even entire chapters of the Bible. We competed against other churches' Bible quiz teams. And then one day, I read the book of Acts. And I saw a movie play out before my eyes. The words on the page came to life. And I watched that film as the actors played out their lives on the stage. For the first time in my life, I knew that this book was at one time reality. That what they were living in the book of Acts, these Jewish followers of the Jewish Messiah, what they were walking in, the power that they manifest in their life, I knew I had never seen ever in my life of going to church. I saw that at one time in the past, the followers of 
of Yeshua walked with the power of God, they had power-filled, abundant lives. The ordinary believer lived with signs and miracles and wonders as part of his life experience of walking in the fifth steps of Yeshua, because these people were listening to the ones who lived with Yeshua, who taught what he taught. And Yeshua said that his followers would do greater works than he did because he would be with them and he would be in them by way of a gift called the Holy Spirit. I knew in spite of my powerless religious upbringing that God was alive today just as he was then. I knew that these things had not passed away, but that I simply did not believe the words of Yeshua because I wasn't taught the words of Yeshua. I wasn't taught what he taught. I was taught Jesus' stories. Well, we're through with the eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus stories. I was finished with it then because I knew that the people in my church had plenty of religion, but I knew that they did not believe. And that if I followed their example, I would not believe. As I followed their example, I was taught not to believe. And so I made the most dramatic step of my life. I began a journey that still I am on that journey to this very day. And I'm inviting you to come along on that journey with me. In the broken cistern of my denomination, we prayed for the sick at every Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. Yet, I never saw or heard of one single person getting healed. I never saw the miraculous until the day that I could sit up straight in the church pew and fall asleep like the deacons and elders. When I could sleep through the sermon, I knew that I had found the key to longevity in church, but that was not the miraculous for which I was looking. When I read the book of Acts, it changed everything because that was real, and I knew that it was real. Something testified to me that this was still real today. Now, at that time, the Vietnam War was still going on, and we had friends that were coming back in body bags. We had several from our church. As a matter of fact, our pastor had, uh, had resigned and became a chaplain, was in Vietnam. And it was then that I decided I was gonna do the hardest thing I could think of doing. I was going to join the Marine Corps. I was going to go into combat arms, uh, infantry, and so I would be guaranteed that I would go to Vietnam because I wanted to see if the dead could be raised. I knew it could be true. I knew the miraculous could happen, and I needed to put myself in the place where miracles could happen because I knew that God was alive, and that is the adventure that I began on. I made them promise me, as actually in my contract, that um, even though everyone from Michigan at that time was going to uh, San Diego to become a Hollywood Marine, as uh, we at uh, Paris Island called them, but I wanted to go to Paris Island, and so they put me on a separate plane. I ended up at, uh, at in South Carolina, at Paris Island Marine Corps Training Depot. That began the adventure, ladies and gentlemen, and that adventure has not stopped because I did get to witness the miraculous. I saw the hand of the Almighty work in such profound ways, that's why I continue doing what I do today. And so I want to take you along with that journey because it's not the events that uh, transpired uh, just in the time that I was in the Marine Corps, but what has happened in the decades since that time, as you can probably determine, I am no longer in the Marine Corps. I've uh, long passed that age, but yet the lessons that I began to learn to how the Bible interprets itself and how to read and understand the scripture and not get in the trap of religion, this has been one of the most difficult paths to walk that I could begin to imagine. And there are many pitfalls along the way, but that is why I'm here to help you in this. Because my church taught me their rules for proper behavior. Sleeping in church was not a sin, but they had a hundred other rules that they called sin, but they weren't in the Bible either. 
And so I'm beginning to ask myself, well, what is sin and what, what, what's the greatest sin that one can commit? And then I found that Yeshua was speaking to a number of religious leaders, and they asked him, saying, "Uh, Master, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Yeshua said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now, if this is the greatest commandment, to love God with everything that we've got, with our heart, with our soul, with our mind, with our everything, then you know, it can be deduced from that that perhaps one of the greatest sins we can commit is loving something else more than we love God. Hewing out our own God, our own power-empty cistern. Well, I want to take you back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and in verse 4, We read, and please take your Bibles. We're going to be using your Bibles a lot. Make sure you have a King James version of the Bible. I don't care. You know, you you can have your your shelves filled with different versions, different texts, Greek text, Hebrew text, but this is our text that we're going to be using because we are going to be able to go from here right back into the original languages, and all the study aids are there. The most voluminous study aids in the history of the human race have been done from the English language back into the original languages. And here in Deuteronomy, Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu Yehovah Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And this is what Yeshua is actually quoting. And it goes on to say in verse 6, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently, diligently unto your children. You shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, and when you lie down at night, and when you rise up in the morning. You cannot enslave a Bible reading people. You cannot enslave them. If they know the truth, the truth will set them free and put their feet on a higher ground. And if you don't, they will end up in slavery because men will take advantage of them. First, through the religious systems, and then, as it is in most of the world, they will be in slavery to atheist socialist governments who say there is no God. See, those who do not believe in God those atheists, they really can't even be Americans. They're not Americans because Americans believe in God-given rights, God-given responsibilities. And as Samuel Adams, the brother of John Adams, uh, our second, um, uh, well, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, along with Benjamin Franklin, were the ones that uh, penned the Declaration of Independence. And it was Samuel Adams who said, we are not basing the future of this, these United States upon the Constitution. This is the time of the Constitutional Convention, putting it all together. He says, we're not basing on that. We're basing it on every individual's ability to govern themselves according to the commandments of God. See, if a person will govern themselves according to the commandments of God, you do not need a police state. But if they will not govern themselves according to the commandments, then you need police. You need a police state in order to hold down the, 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 those who live in absolute abandon. That's why, you know, as we see, all these shootings happening in America, most of the shootings, mass shootings that are happening are those who are on drugs that are being advertised every night and every day, all day long on the television system because it's a multi-billion dollar industry and the psychotropics that are being peddled in America, this is what's turning people into absolute animals. Animals that have no God, they have absolutely no compunction and now we see that it takes the long arm of the law to keep those in check. But if people will govern themselves according to the commandments of God, then you do not need the police state. And everyone 
as is uh, often said that uh, an armed society is a polite society. When everyone has the ability to protect themselves, everyone is pleasant, everyone gets along, and uh, that is true. And when people govern themselves according to the commandments of God, it is a very peaceful society. The very first commandment shouted down from the flaming mountain in Arabia, I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other gods, El Panai, literally in my face. He said, I, I don't want to hear about them. I, uh, later on he says, I do not even want you to name the names of other gods. He wants us to be holy, to be separated, and to understand him, and to worship him, and to obey him by freedom of will. And when we do, then life is sweet. But yet, the prophet Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Turn to Hosea, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, and there we read, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject you that you will no longer be a priest to me. He's speaking to the nation of Israel, who is called to be a royal priesthood, to be his prophets to the world. But my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, it's not the lack of knowledge of science or philosophy. It's because they rejected the knowledge of the true God. They've hewn out their own cistern, their own, their, their own God. And he says, because you have rejected knowledge, and it's the knowledge of the true God, I will reject you. You are no longer going to be a priest to me, because that is what's required of a priest, to understand him and then to be his representative. And then he said, seeing that you have forgotten the law of your God, and again, the word law is the word Torah, which means instruction. Now, I know, whenever someone says, it's the law, immediately you picture flashing blue lights, handcuffs, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say will be held against you in the court of law. That is not what the word law is in the scripture. When you see the word law, it is Torah, it is instructions. It is the instructions of a loving heavenly father to his children of how to love him and how to love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two commandments, every single commandment in the Torah hangs on those two commandments. Yeshua said it and it is understood. To, how to love God and how to love our neighbor, that is why we're given these instructions. But because we have forgotten those instructions, the Almighty says, I am rejecting you. You will not be a priest to me. You will not be my representative because you have forgotten my instructions and I am going to forget your children. Because we are supposed to be teaching our children when they rise up in the morning as we sit at the table during the day, as we walk by the way, as we lay down at night, our children are supposed to know the truth so the truth sets them free from the bondage of government and religion. Yes, we have rejected the knowledge of God, the knowledge of him which is revealed in his instructions. We are not going to ever again think of the word law in the negative, because this is the absolute loving commandments of our loving Heavenly Father. Now, I want to continue on. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians, we are going to go to the Brit Hadashah, the renewed covenant. We are going to go to one of Shaul or Paul's epistles. This is a letter they wrote to the believers in Thessalonica. And it's actually his second letter that he wrote to the believers there. And he is speaking about the, the end of days and some of the things that would be transpiring upon the earth during that time and the deception. He says, because they, this is uh, the, the 10th verse of the second chapter, says, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, which is to be made whole, God shall send them a strong delusion so that they will believe a lie. 
Now, first of all, because they did not receive the love of the truth. Now, to receive the love of the truth implies that the love of the truth has to be offered. Because you can't receive something that is not available. And so the love of the truth is something that we see that that the Almighty offers to everyone who draws breath on planet Earth. And this is very important because I I think that the, the terminology love, as in love, the love of money is the root of all evil. See, you can never get enough of that which you love. You can never get enough. If you love someone, you can't get enough of them. If you love money, you can't get enough money. If you love the truth, you can't get enough truth. And most people, when they're offered the love of the truth, here it is, this is what you get in life. Would you like to have the truth? Would you like to receive this gift of the love of the truth? You will not you, you no longer how long you live, you will never get enough truth, but you'll be desirous of it. Will you receive it? Everyone is offered the love of the truth. And the love of the truth that they might be saved. The word saved in Greek is sozo, which is to be made whole. That's simply what it means, to be made whole. It can be made physically whole, emotionally whole, spiritually whole, mentally whole. It's just to be made whole. And if you love the truth, then your life will be filled up and complete. That's why I say power-filled abundant living that you will be filled to overflowing with the love of the truth and your life will take on a quality that you could never ever imagine when you come to know the true God who makes himself known through his word, not through religion. Yeshua said that the path that leads to destruction is extremely broad and nearly everyone, it says in the Greek, goes that way. But the gate that leads to life is extremely narrow and very few, very few will ever find it. The broad path that leads to destruction is religion. Everyone is religious. Everyone, even atheists are religious. They have a religion called evolution. It describes how we got here without there being a creator. Bizarre as as it seems, there are actually people who Uh, ascribe to that religion. It takes faith far beyond anything I can comprehend. I don't have enough faith for that, okay? But that is a religion of atheists. Everyone is religious. The question is, have we received the love of the truth? The truth is that which makes us whole, that which completes our life. The love of the truth, it's a gift offered to every man by the Almighty. If they do not receive that gift, God will give them just what they really wanted, a strong delusion so that they can believe a comfortable lie. The word send, he will send them a strong delusion. The word send in in the Greek is pempo, which means to send one home to where they're comfortable. You don't want to receive the love of the truth? Don't worry. I'll give you a strong delusion. You can believe whatever lie you want to. You can go to sleep, and when you wake up, you can believe anything they want you to believe. But if you want the truth, there's only one place to find it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, this is Shaul, Paul, writing to Timothy. Now, Timothy's mother was Jewish, and, uh, and his father was, uh, was a Gentile. And Timothy writes to him and says, from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation or unto wholeness through faith which is in Christ Jesus or Yeshua Messiah, as it would have been spoken in, in the day. From a child you've known the holy scriptures. Why did he know the, the scriptures? Because his mother was Jewish. His mother taught him when he rose up in the morning, as he sat at the table, as they walked by the way uh, at at night, uh, when he was put down to sleep, learning the scriptures his whole life. But what scriptures that, that are able to make us wise to salvation 
through the faith which is in Yeshua Messiah, what scriptures was he being taught? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians? No, they didn't exist. The gospel still would not be written for decades. The scriptures that he's speaking of is the Torah, the instructions, and the prophets that call everyone back to keeping the commandments that teach us how to love God and how to love our neighbor as ourself. The scripture is what he's speaking of is the Tanakh. Tanakh, the acronym for Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. The Torah, the instructions of the Almighty, the Nevi'im, or the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which are the other writings, the historical books, etc. See, sin is defined in the Torah. It tells us when we're transgressing the will of the Almighty. It tells us when we're transgressing the rights of other individuals such as, thou shalt not, as it says in King James, kill. It's literally in Hebrew, it's murder. Thou shalt not murder. And in this day, the Almighty gave the authority, not only permission, but the responsibility, says he that kills someone, murders someone, must his life must be taken by man. And so that's why courts are set up to be able to do this and to do it righteously to make sure that the innocent are not put to death. But yet, when we transgress and, and hurt man, then we see that that is sin against the Almighty. And so the Torah defines what sin is. And this is actually what it says in, in 1 John. It says sin is the violation of the Torah. That's what it is. It's not the violation of the rules of your particular denomination. Violation of the Torah is sin. What does the Torah tell us? Thou shalt not add to the commandments that I give you. Thou shalt not diminish or subtract from that you may keep all the commandments of Yehovah, your Elohim, the Lord your God. See, once you add a commandment or take away commandments, you no longer have the commandments of God. You have the beginning of a man-made religious system. And when we redefine sin, when we make rules and regulations that are not in the scriptures and put these up as a standard of righteousness, then we have formed a cult. We formed a denomination. We have formed our own prashim, a beautiful word, prashim or Pharisee, meaning separated ones, because we separate ourselves from the commandments of the Almighty when we make up our own rules and regulations. And this is what we see all through Yeshua's life and ministry. All through his ministry, he never violates the Torah, never breaks the commandments. But what does he do? He vehemently, repeatedly, over and over in their face, completely, openly violates the man-made rules that the Prashim had put in place. And the Prashim, the separated ones of those days, is no different than the Prashim, the separated ones of our days that have all the rules and regulations of their particular denominations. Ladies and gentlemen, Yeshua is still alive. And if he is in you, he is going to call you out from the religion of this world. He is going to offer you the gift of the love of the truth. And if you'll receive it, then you are going to be on a different path your entire life. Sin is defined by the Torah and in the Torah. And breaking the Torah, breaking the commandments of God is sin. The Nevi'im, the prophets, they are the ones that call people back to the commandments in the Torah. See, the Torah is de described as a fence around God's people. The fence. And we are all supposed to be inside the fence. We are all to love God. We are all to love our neighbors ourselves. And every commandment fits within that fence. It teaches us how to do that. And so within this fence, we are protected. And as we were told before we took our place in the promised land, we were told that we were to agree that anyone who is outside of the fence, outside of the commandments, was under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not remain inside the fence and keeping the commandments. Now what religion does 
Some religions say, well, we put up a fence around the fence so that no one even gets close to breaking the fence, the commandments of God. Wait, the original fence says, no one adds to and no one subtracts from. So instead of putting a fence around the fence, what they did is they broke open the fence and then made a separate corral in which they herd you so that you can be systematically fleeced and taken advantage by their religion. See, this is the kingdom of heaven. These are the rules of the Almighty. These are the rules that Yeshua will establish and everyone will live by and when he lives and reigns and rules upon the planet. There is no difference. These are the rules. This, These are the rules of the kingdom. If you break that down and make up your own fence, it's an alternative kingdom. It is an alternative universe that will not see the kingdom of heaven. That's why Yeshua said, the gate is very narrow that leads to life. We need to follow him. We need to listen to him because he has led us on this path. He said, I am the door. I am the gate. Listen to me. Follow me. Because every religious system out there will attempt to take you down the path of destruction.